Welcome to our evening service. We'll be singing song number 67, The Old Ruddy Cross. And we'll stand when we get there. And 
dad came to church one of those times, and I was standing right next to him. And, and I, I remember very, very well, we started singing the old rugged cross. I didn't think my dad knew any hymns. He went to church. How did he know hymns? And I'm standing next to my dad, and all of a sudden, he just starts singing the old rugged cross. And my, I also found out he had a very nice voice. Yeah. And he stood right there. He knew the old rugged cross. He sang right through it. He sang through the other hymns. He, he knew the hymns. And it was years down the road that I found out my dad actually was raised in a Baptist church. And, uh, you know, it, it was just, I don't know what the break was with my dad. I really don't. I found thinking probably it was Second World War. Uh, he, he was in the Second World War. He fought in Europe and he fought in the South Pacific. Very, very unusual, but that is what happened. Uh, not only did he fight in the Battle of the Bulge, he, he fought in the Battle for Berlin, he also fought in the battles for the Philippines. And uh, just, uh, I don't know if that was the break point with him or, or what it was, but he just, church was not something that he went to except once in a great while. But again, the old rugged cross, I was absolutely shocked when my dad just starts singing the old rugged cross. And it's been a memory I was simply kept all my life. But he got me a better yet than you knew. Uh, again, looking at the Lord's Supper, uh, again, what a wonderful time as we come, and again, the song, the old rugged cross. I mean, that is that is a draw, literally, tonight, to what we're looking at. Listen, this is the representation of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Right. It is that old rugged cross on which he died. It was, again, we back up from the cross just those few hours and, and he is tortured, he is mocked, uh, he, is, he is beaten, uh, he is crowned of thorns, all those horrible things that we know of. He's falsely accused, he's condemned over that which, again, those who knew and those who could have set him free, the one who could have set him free, washed his hands and walked away. That did not wash the blood of Jesus Christ off his hands. Uh, you can't simply turn your back and walk away and think you're free uh, of what you've done. But again, the, just the wonder of what Jesus went through physically. Right. But we have always, again, as we've walked through communion or looked at communion or, or the introduction to communion, so often you know, we come back to that reality. The physical torture, the physically being nailed to the cross, those physical things were absolutely horrible, unbelievable, excruciatingly so. But it was the spiritual things that was true. I mean, Jesus Christ, the holy, sinless Son of God, and just, just chew on that a minute, the holy, sinless Son of God, right. never knew sin, never sinned, and yet he became, the Bible says, sin for us. Right. He took on all of our sin. He became sin. How can, how can the holy, sinless Son of God become sin? Because God the Father took our sin and he laid it upon his Son. That we might be able to go to him for forgiveness. Our forgiveness is through his blood. Amen. And again, this isn't his blood. This is a representation. This is a reminder as we have the juice here tonight. And of course, the crack, it's, it's just, it's this unleavened bread, if you will. It's just a representation of the body of Jesus Christ. But this is to be done until Jesus comes. Right. That was his commandment to the church. And that is why we've continued to do this as the church for over 2,000 years. Until he comes as a reminder that he gave his body physically and his blood physically, went to the cross and shed, shed his blood to his death. He was stone cold dead on the cross. Right. And yet he did it for our spiritual awakening, for our spiritual, we are saved for time and eternity through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And the only way that that could happen is for somehow, some way, that man could have never dreamed of. Somehow, 
our sins had to be taken away. God cannot look upon sin. Okay? God cannot look upon sin. And so our sin had to be taken away. And the only way that that could be done was on the pure, sinless Son of God. Right. He had to take our sin and become sin for us. As we look tonight, and I'm going to read the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 9. And here in chapter 9, read verses 22 through 28. We stand for the reading of God's word tonight. Chapter 9, beginning in verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. There is no taking away. There is no forgiveness. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. And the idea of the patterns of the things in the heavens means a picture, pattern, picture, should be purified with these, blood. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Well, what sacrifices did, did Israel have? Animal sacrifices. Had to be better than that. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. Again, this idea of figures, the pictures of that which is true in heaven. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, made by men, okay, which are the figures or the picture of the true, but into heaven itself. He enters into the reality, into heaven itself, to appear in the presence of God for us. Listen, he appears there. He does it for us. Jesus Christ, and again, the teaching of the word of God. Listen, he, his blood is taken, and his blood is presented to God that the sacrifice, the eternal sacrifice of his son is done. Right. Nor yet that he should offer himself often. But now remember, go back to the Hebrew sacrifices, Sacrifices are being made all the time. And for the nation Israel, once a year, year after year after year. So as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundations of the world. If we're talking about Jesus Christ's sacrifice, his sacrifice would have had been over and over and over again. But now once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Amen. Sacrifices over and over and over and over again. The priest for the nation Israel, every year, every year, every year, Jesus Christ came, made the eternal sacrifice once. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment makes it very clear. You know, and again, so many around the world, so many have taken on religions, and I have people in my own family, uh, they're, they're Buddhist. And, and, you know, listen, reincarnation, all kinds of different things. No, it's appointed unto men what? Once to die. You do not die and come back and die and come back. And the interesting thing is all of that. You die and you come back, you're supposed to be trying to live a perfect life. Okay? Well, of course, you fail. And, and so you come back and you fail. And you come back and you fail. And you come back and you fail. And you're supposed to keep coming back until what? You get it right. And, and then finally, you can attain away from this sin sick world. And as an appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin, unto salvation. Amen. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this time we have this evening. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this communion service tonight. Just draw our attention to the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Draw our attention, Heavenly Father, as how we need to walk in this world. Again, to be the witnesses for Jesus Christ that we need to be. And may this evening be a time that we are attentive to the word of God, that we are attentive to our own sin. And that we, again, when we look at ourselves before we take communion, 
uh, when we take that time to look into the inner man and simply say, God, if there is anything between myself and you, God, I want to know. I want to confess it. I want to get it right. As a Heavenly Father God, might we look deeply into our own lives and confess anything and everything that is there that we might walk worthy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We will thank you for it. We ask it in his name. Amen. You may be seated. On the night before his crucifixion, our Lord Jesus observed the Passover with his disciples in the upper room. And then following the departure of Judas Iscariot, he instituted the ordinance of communion. That is when this table was first set. And it was first set by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It symbolizes the substitutionary and redemptive death of the Son of God. It's substitutionary is what? He took my place. He's, he's right. a substitute for me. But it was my sin. He never sinned. But he is my substitute. And it is a substitutionary redemptive. He took my place that I might be redeemed. And of course, we've looked at redemption many times. We're, the idea of redemption is what? Purchased. We are bought back from the slave market of sin. We have been redeemed. It was the blood of Jesus Christ, which was the only payment. Right. And my, what a payment. Amen. A holy payment that I might have forgiveness for my sin. And, and so, again, it was substitutionary, took my place. It was redemptive that it redeemed me from my sin. And so it was that redemptive death of the Son of God. Listen, the reverent awe that we should be brought to every single time we approach this table because of what he's done, because of who he is. Listen, when he walked the earth bodily, he was still God. Right. God, holy God. But during that time, he also was man, very man. He was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. And he walked this earth and paid the price for our sins. As we walk down through just a, a few things this evening, um, there's, there's just different ways as we prepare to participate in a, a worthy manner, a holy manner, and come to this table prepared. Our minds prepared, our hearts prepared, our searching prepared that we might come to this table tonight. One of the things that we need to do is we need to look back. You know, so often uh, we, we like to just move forward, move ahead, keep going, and there are things in my past, maybe as far back as yesterday, you know, whatever that may be, it may be way back in the past, it may have been earlier today, that there are things in the past we need to deal with it. We need to take care of it. Now, once we've taken care of it before God, what does God do? Forgive. He forgives it and then, and what? Forgives and it. forgets. God forgives and forgets. Now, I want to tell you what, that made so, meant so much to me when I learned that shortly after I got saved. Mm -hmm. God doesn't remember. God forgave me and he forgot it. And then I learned something else. Man, never forgot. Okay? Now, those things that you have done in your past, men will bring it up. Men will remember. And, and again, just, again, when I went back and pastored in my hometown after, what, 17, 18 years of being gone, and nobody said it to my face. But when there are certain people in the church, they were that's really good witnesses in that church. And they'd be witnessing. It's a little town. Everybody knows everybody. And they say, I knew your preacher before he was a preacher. Mm -hmm. They don't forget. God forgave and forgot, right. but they didn't. And, and so this reality, there's always scars. Sin leaves a scar. Right. And, and they are scars that, that people, again, will point out from time to time. But we need, again, look backwards. In, in meditation, 
with, with, with complete consecration, if you will, that we should look backwards to our own lives, be sure that we've taken care of the problems of the past. But then moving forward also and in looking back to the atoning Christ, the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Listen, he was slain and his blood was shed for my redemption, that I might be redeemed. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And I just want to take a look at verses 18 and 19 of chapter 1. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed, listen, not redeemed, with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition from your fathers. Listen, anything that is not Christ, anything that is not the blood of Christ, Listen, it can't redeem me. Right. It cannot bring me to that place. And, and here he's talking about the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen. The only way to redemption is the blood of Jesus Christ, is the giving of the body of Jesus Christ. And look at 1 John uh, chapter 1. In 1 John chapter 1, I just want to look there at verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he, of course, reference to Christ, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Amen. Listen, as we walk in the light of the gospel, the light of the good news of Jesus Christ. As we walk in the light, as he is in the light, just as Jesus Christ walks in the light because he is light. He is the light of the world. world. And as Jesus Christ is the light of the world, and we walk in that light of Jesus Christ. While we're, while we're in this sin-sick world, as long as I'm walking in the light of Jesus Christ, we walk in light as he is in the light. What? We have fellowship one with another. Other believers, others who know Jesus Christ with, a, with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, uh, cleanseth us from all sin. As long as I'm walking in the light of Jesus Christ, being obedient to the word of God, I am cleansed. Amen. And continually cleansed. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse. cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a wonderful thing that God has done for us. But first tonight, I just want you to just put in, put in your thinking, we should look backwards. Make sure we have everything taken care of because looking back, we also see that Jesus Christ is taking care of it. He's taken care of all my sin. He's done all of those things. The only thing that he waits upon is my personal repentance. Listen, we, we have to repent of our sin. We have to come to a place that I'm sorry, deeply sorry before God for my sin and seek forgiveness. Secondly, first we look backwards. Secondly, we should look upwards. And again, with, with an attitude of reverent submission. Attitude of reverent submission. God, whatever you want me to do, how is that reverent? I'm looking to God. I am revering God above all others. I revere him. And so when I come before him in reverent submission, because you are God, I submit to anything that you want me to do. Absolutely anything. I will do what God wants me to do. Now, almost everything that God wants us to do is right in this world. Right. And, and so the reality of how do I know? Know the scriptures. Amen. Study the word. Do those things. Walk with God. But we should have that upward look of reverent submission. We should look upward to the Christ 
again, and the exalted position of his lordship. Not only do I turn it over to God, I also turn it over to Jesus Christ, who is Lord of Lords. He's my Lord. And again, you say, well, wait a minute, I thought you said God. Now you're telling me it's, it's Jesus. That's right. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're talking about God. And as we submit to God and the wonder of God. Look at Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, I want to start out in verse 5 of chapter 2. And it tells me here, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now that is an amazing statement. Let this mind be in you. Now this can only apply to a Christian. A non-Christian cannot have the mind of Christ. But let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus Christ was equal with God. If you've seen me, he said, what? You've seen the Father. He also said, I and the Father are one. And so listen, Jesus Christ and God the Father are one. And, but he made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Listen, here he is the equal of God. He is God the Son. And yet, verse 7, but he made himself of no reputation. He came to earth taking on the body of a human being, and no one looking at that human walking the streets of Jerusalem is going to say, there goes God. He was a man. And so, again, he lowered himself, if you will, of no man's of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, not a master, not the Lord, but of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Here he now is, what, in the form of human beings. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Boy, I mean, how obedient was he going to be when he came to earth? I mean, I mean, he's God the Son. He's the Lord of all. And yet he became obedient even unto death. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him because of his absolute willingness and volunteering to go to the cross. Right. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And as we've pointed out so many times, Everything Jesus did pointed to God the Father. Even the sacrifice of himself on the cross. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To Jesus Christ? No. To the glory of God the Father. He always points to the Father. Listen, we should look backwards. We should look upwards. The Christ who died on the cross now sits on the throne at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Also, as we consider these things tonight, we should look inward. And, and, and this is one of the things that a lot of people, they just, they can't do it. They refuse to look in here. We can look out here. We can even look backwards. You know, my life wasn't that bad. I mean, I was all right. I didn't kill anybody. It was fine. And we can look at what we're doing now. And we say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm a hard worker, I provide for my family. We can go through so many different things that, that says, hey, I'm a good guy. But they refuse to look inside. Who are you inside? What about the people we come in contact with that we need to witness to? You know, they may look good on the outside, but who are they inside? Is, is, is the question. And we need to be willing with, with the 
purest motives possible, we should, number one, look into our own hearts. Mm -hmm. First, our own. We look at ourselves and request divine help to pursue every possible sin, every attitude, every ambition that is contrary to the mind of God. Mm -hmm. Are there those things in me that is literally contrary to the mind of God, the directives of God? Because if it is, it needs to get out. Okay, so we need to look inwardly. And again, listen, Jesus Christ died that we might live. Amen. It's the reason I have this, this life in Christ, that I am saved at all, is because of what he did for me. He became poor, what? That we might be rich. He gave his all, that we might have all. And that all of the grace of the goodness of God. That's why Jesus Christ died. And so as we are looking at these things, backward, upward, inward, uh, we need to be doing these things just one step closer to Christ, one step closer to Christ, staying in the light, walking in the word, being those who truly love our Lord. And also we should look forward. <laughs> so when, when we have looked backwards, upwards, inward, we also need to continue to be looking forwards. Right. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, you can show the what? Lord's death till he come. We need to be looking forward to the coming of our Lord and Savior, Amen. Jesus Christ. Well, what, of, of all the commands, if you will, I like this one. Amen. Well, which we should be looking. Jesus is coming. We'd be looking for him. We'd be looking ahead. And, and you've heard me say this before. But old, old Pastor Hugh Hamilton up at Hamilton Acres Baptist Church in, in Fairbanks. Somebody would come and tell him how horrible something did you hear? You know, this war just broke out over there. This just happened in Los Angeles. Some terrible thing just took place down in Texas. You know, and, and, and old brother, he went, hey man, brother, hey man, Jesus is coming. <laughs> Dude, the worse it gets, the closer it is to Jesus coming. Amen. You know, and he just, amen, hallelujah. You can tell me all the terrible things you want. I'm going to praise God. Amen. Look, I'm looking ahead. I know what's happening. All this peripheral garbage that's going on. Man, I can't let that drag you down, brother. Right. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Understand where we are. Understand who we are as believers. And understand who God is. Mm -hmm. And that he has given us. We've been studying through Revelation. What an amazing thing. He's told us the future. We know what is going to happen. Right. Listen, so as we look forward. Our Savior came first, what? As a peasant. Listen, he, he didn't even have a, a, a place to lay his head. And yet, he comes as a peasant. The second time, as the Prince of God. Right. The second time is different. <clears throat> he came the first time in great humility, taking on the body of a man. But when he comes next time, he will come the second time as with great Power and glory. That's right. And he came the first time to occupy a cross. What a horrible thing. What a horrible death. But he will come the second time to occupy a throne. That's right. Amen. Listen, before which, as we already read, what every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is the Lord of glories. He's the Lord. What an amazing thing as we come to this table. And this is dealing with ourselves. We need to look backwards. We need to look upwards. We need to look inwards. And we need to look forward. Because all of those things apply to this table. Mm -hmm. And apply to me before I partake at this table. Go ahead and turn to First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 11. Where this all comes home to roost as far as this evening is concerned is verse 28. But let a man examine himself 
And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. That we examine ourselves and we find a fault there does not necessarily mean I shouldn't partake of communion. What it means is I examine myself, I find a fault there, and I do what about it? Confess it. I confess it. I repent. That God forgive me. And then, what does this say? But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. As we examine ourselves in just a couple of minutes here tonight, do it in such a way that we're, we have that backward look, upward look, inward look, and forward look concerning Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, how we thank you for your word. We thank you for your testament and your testimony. We thank you for Jesus Christ and what he has given to us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you call us to this table, that you allow us, even that, that we can examine ourselves and seek forgiveness. God, you, you don't even, you have no reason to forgive sin, but you have chosen through the blood of your Son to forgive my sin. And so, Heavenly Father God, may we again come to this table tonight after some true heart searching that we might partake of communion as you have commanded us to. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. God, thank you for what you've done and what you will do. And we thank you in Jesus' name.